Well, good evening and uh, welcome to this, our 62nd show. And uh, we're delighted to have with us today Peter Oborn, uh, veteran journalist, former chief political uh, writer for the Daily Telegraph, Richard Saunders, um, who has been a and is a renowned filmmaker and, of course, uh, has recently produced uh, Al Jazeera, The Labour Files, which is what we're going to talk about this evening because... Uh, a lot of people have been talking about it, but they haven't really been talking about it in the UK national media, which is where you would have thought they might have been. It seems to I've been getting calls from people from all over the world saying, ah, yes, will we watch this? What's going on uh, from Malaysia, from Australia, from Canada, from the US? Um, and uh, it appears that uh, Al Jazeera's Labour Files is being viewed and discussed rather more with rather more ease and interest by media elsewhere in the world. Now, um, I, I suppose I should declare an interest. I was a member of the Labour Party for, I was thinking about it today, I joined in 1977, so 43-odd years until I resigned as a result of discovering that, yes, a file had been compiled upon me too. So, uh, and I actually did write to the uh, General Secretary, David Evans, at the time, saying, uh, could he let me have a copy, although I already had it, and he never responded. Uh, at that point, I thought, well, really... Uh, this is so utterly ludicrous. It's a horrendously serious issue uh, and one that we are going to talk about this evening. Um, I did also work for Al Jazeera for six years as well. So I'm absolutely delighted that Al Jazeera um, was the place uh, for, for your uh, documentaries, Richard. I think they've been methodically researched uh, and everybody's been given uh, an opportunity to respond to uh, what you have discovered and what you have said was the biggest ever um, leak of uh, material from a political party. We do usually talk about what's going on in Israel, Palestine and Middle East politics. But today, you know, given that this issue has had an effect, arguably, on uh, the Labour Party and its foreign policy positions over Israel and Palestine, certainly has implications uh, as Britain prepares possibly for a change of government in the next couple of years. We look at many of the people who have been around uh, and who are working for the Labour Party, who could be in quite senior positions in the British state. And um, one of the questions we are going to be trying to address today is, do, if, if people are capable of some of these activities, as outlined in your documentary, what could they be capable of if Labour gets into government? Um, I wonder if I could... Um, I think what we should do, actually, because what we did see was... Uh, a studied um, lack of interest by the Labour Party officially in your documentary. And speaking to uh, other former colleagues at Al Jazeera, they were genuinely surprised, um, Richard, that, you know, there wasn't, you know, the, the British media seemed to be paying no attention to this at all. This, is, this was the sort of programming that Panorama itself, we'll talk about them later, would have um, conducted themselves. And yet there was no discussion. And in fact, one of the trailers for your documentary, I think we have it. We have it here, uh, is of senior uh, figures of the British Labour Party arriving at the conference that was recently held in Liverpool and being asked, had they watched the documentary? Perhaps we can have a very quick look at that. Mr. Ben, what? Al Jazeera. I wonder if you've seen the Labour files. Of... I have not. No. Mr. Lamy, sorry. I'm to... so sorry, I've got to... Oh, OK. And together with the British people, we will do it. Thank you, Conference. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, we've got to go to an event. I'm I know, really we were just going to ask Lisa and Andy if you've heard the Labour files. We've, uh, we've got to go to an no. event. No? Oh! Thank you. Did you see the Labour files? No, I didn't. You haven't seen them? No. Oh, yes, yes. Treating, do you have just two minutes for a quick sorry? question? We've got to go, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. sorry. I'm really... I'm no, so no sorry. Well, um, there we have it. Which is remarkable, really, because as we know, all of the uh, figures there, very senior British political figures in the Labour Party, uh, are very well-paid political activists. And uh, since I know 
we all know that members of the Labour Party and many of those who are no longer members of the Labour Party were all busy talking about it. The idea that somehow um, uh, these uh, politicians were unaware, uh, did not wish to uh, talk to the Al Jazeera journalists about Labour files was really rather instructive. Um, but what was your take on this um, extraordinary lack of uh, uh, interest uh, from these many of these figures who would have been rushing to the camera two or three years ago if they'd been asked about... Um, uh, about uh, claims about uh, the, Mr. Corbyn and others. Yes, it's the Labour Party and the press more generally, isn't it? I think I think you know it was always highly likely the Labour Party would try and bury it. I think it was always highly likely the press would not be terribly interested in a series which, in part, pointed out how badly they had covered the whole issue. Uh, we worked very hard to get it out for the Labour Party conference, and then I think in the end we were unlucky with our timing because you had this extraordinary implosion of the government in the in the weeks leading up to the party conference and you know you, there, there was a there was triumphalism in the air in liverpool another you know, sort of whiff of 97 and all that and um neither the party nor the media were very interested in raking over the coals or listening to a bunch of whinging lefties so i think we were we were they were always like to try and ignore us and we were we're unlucky with our timing. What I do find extraordinary is that the very serious questions we have raised about the panorama are just being ignored. Because remarkable, regardless of the political climate, the political moment, and so on, it's an extraordinarily important thing if the nation's state broadcaster um, runs a film as brutally hostile or as, as critical of, of the leader of the opposition as that panorama was. Now, we, you know, we've... We've been very concrete and tangible in the allegations we've made against that panorama. It's not a sort of scattergun critique. And the, the, the BBC has made no attempt at response at all. And it's, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the strategy is to stand still and not blink and hope that we go away and to rely on the rest of the media to, to play along with this. And, and, and the fact is it seems to be working. But it, it seems to me extraordinary that panorama thinks it can just walk away from this without answering, at least providing an explanation for some of the, you know, quite serious allegations that are contained in the film. Yes, I'm, I'm Richard, I wanted to come back to Panorama a little bit later, um, but the, these, are, these are hugely valid points. And um, it, it, as you say, it does seem pretty extraordinary that uh, given, um, given that when you were actually, well, we were not, let's talk about the Panorama, because, you know, you, you, you gave... Um, you gave the BBC the opportunity to to come back to you with the questions you raised about the, 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 their approach and the fact that it wasn't it was because I, I was in, in my own mind, I was thinking to myself, well, perhaps it is the case that really um, they spoke to the wrong people. They were being misled um, that, uh, you know, essentially there were mistakes made. But as you as you watched your documentary, it became quite apparent that there had been some quite deliberate omissions and some really quite basic omissions of um, is investigation uh, and inquiry. So it's a there's a you could say there's a lack of professionalism, but it seems to be it seems to be more serious than that. Is that is that is that what you would be? Would you agree with that? Well, I wouldn't get information. All I, all I can talk about is what is observable in in the panorama. But there are. You know, I've made over 20 um, dispatches and the four specific points we are light on, I would never have tried to get them into a dispatches and I would have had a very, very rough ride from the lawyers at Channel 4. I'm quite, you know, I, I'm quite sure I would if I had tried to. And I think it, um, I, I've, you know, I'm just looking at those things from the point of view of a producer and, and thinking to myself, well, you know, imagining to myself the conversation I'm going to have with a lawyer about that, I find it very surprising that they were included in the film and very surprising that they got past the, um, the BBC's legal and editorial processes. Yes, I mean, on, on one of them, and, and, and Richard or Peter, I mean, perhaps we could have a, a look at this and you, you, see what, you see what you think about this, because... There was, um, and I don't, I don't know if we have this clip, which is the clip of uh, an email uh, sent by the then leader of the Labour Party's uh, chief of staff, Seamus Milne. Um, and this was uh, suggested by Panorama as evidence of 
uh, Corbyn's office it actively interfering in the handling of disciplinary hearings to clear political allies accused of anti-Semitism. This was a very, very serious claim. Um, and yet, I, I don't know if we have we have we ever could we have a quick look at that clip. Um, I don't know if they can hear us, but anyway, they, we they, I, we can we can return to one or two uh, specifics um, uh, uh, later, perhaps. But I mean, it, it, there was there was a there was a this this particular email from recollection um, that, that there were parts that were used and parts that were not, and it was the the, the part that it was it was it was used essentially to make a and point. his office have repeatedly said that when. Party members are accused of anti-Semitism. They don't interfere in the disciplinary process. Indeed, the Labour Party said any such suggestion is categorically untrue. But that doesn't seem to be the case. In an email, Mr Corbyn's Director of Communications, Seamus Milne, asked for a review of the disciplinary process into anti-Semitic complaints. There was a risk, he said, of muddling up political disputes with racism. How did you interpret that email from Mr Milne? The, the same way that all staff in Labour's head office did, which is that this was the leader's office requesting to be uh, involved directly in the disciplinary process. Our investigation finds that communications director Seamus Milne is specifically asked for his view by Emily Oldno, an executive director who oversees the disputes team. Milne is also referring to a very specific case. James Schneider worked alongside Milne and has the full email that Matthews referred to in the Panorama program. It reads, this member is a Jewish activist, the son of a Holocaust survivor. If we're more than very occasionally using disciplinary action against Jewish members for anti-Semitism, something's going wrong and we're muddling up political disputes with racism. Quite apart from this specific case, I think going forward, we need to review where and how we're drawing the line if we're going to have clear and defensible processes. So how this is used is just the red bit. So these 10 words, the great irony is that this is totally correct and is borne out as being totally correct because the Labour Party has actually again and again disciplined Jewish people disproportionately for anti-Semitism because it has been muddling up political disputes with racism, political disputes within the Jewish community. Did you want to have, uh, did you want to comment on that, Richard? I mean, that did seem to be a very... Uh... Uh, an edited version of a letter to make a point, and it was actually quite graphically demonstrated there. And this is uh, this is actually research that could really have been done a lot better by the BBC Panorama. There was a conditional um, is a conditional sentence, and they've missed the condition out. Um, I mean, Panorama. My understanding is, you know, I would assume Panorama. Well, it did. You can see it on the screen. It had the whole email, so it's not mm. a failure. of of research. I and mean, I think you, John Ware, I think at various times, partly in response to something Peter and I wrote in Open Democracy, also in response to Navarra Media, has um, published very long explanations of why he thinks that treatment of that email was fair. People can go and look at, uh, at that there and make up their own minds. I mean, I would um, point out that the Labour Party released this email, I think the day after, you know, I mean, one thing I would say about the, certainly the reporting on the panorama in my film, you know, I've got to be honest about this. None of it's new. It's all in the public domain. I've just put it all together and, and put it on a platform where, you know, yeah. a reasonable number of people are going to see it. But none of this was news. You know, if you were paying attention, I mean, jo you know, the shout out to Joshua Funnell of the Canary, who wrote about the Rika Bird, um, Ben Westerman story the week after the program went out. He had that tape recording. The week after the the program went out, you know, there's been a, a definite desire not to report this story. Yes, well, Peter, I mean, in in um, in the immediate uh, period after uh, the documentaries came out, I mean, I got in touch with a number of uh, former journalist colleagues, be 
well known to you, um, such as Michael Crick, who later said, yes, we should really have been much more alive to what was going on and much more inquisitive. But others said, oh, this is old hat. Um, this is all old stuff. What are you going on about? Um, and of course, uh, this is all part of uh, some kind of political Corbyn sect and what have you. But except that many, many people who have watched this don't come to all of this with any... They don't, they're not necessarily involved in the Labour Party. They're not really involved in the sort of battles that have taken place in it. But I mean, um, you know, the, the, the revelations have been um, quite, quite astonishing. So, and I, I think at one stage um, you, you wrote, um, it's noteworthy that many of those on the other side of the argument are not represented in the films, although they were offered the right to reply. But if its overall thesis is correct, the entire history of the Labour Party over the last seven years will need to be recast, and Corbyn himself should be seen as a largely, largely innocent rather than the ran, rancid anti-Semitism enabler portrayed in the run-up to the 2019 election and thereafter. Um, so what, 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 where, where does this leave us, really? I mean, will at some stage, does history get revisited? Do these things matter? Are they old hat? Um, I think that, um, and I say this in the film, you know, we, we you, uh, as journalists, so I wasn't sort of involved in reporting on any of this, but uh, but people like John Ware uh, or the Panorama, Panorama at the BBC are hugely respectable. So you saw this uh, and you thought, oh, well, that must be right. You know, John Ware, the BBC, they're not going to get anything wrong. Uh, and they, they, they're making these immensely serious allegations. And there are all sorts of other journalists I really respected who were making, uh, were reporting on, on Labour anti-Semitism. Uh, and so you tended to, to, to believe what was being said and done. And I, I do think that it is important to, that, that, that we should, as journalists, as conscientious journalists, all of us, and that includes me, revisit our journalism be ready to do that um, because we have a duty an overriding duty as journalists to tell the truth uh, not to take part in and if we do make errors of judgment or errors of fact all of us do we have a duty to uh, 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 to acknowledge that uh, yes Peter, you see, I'm 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 thinking that you know I think you've mentioned other recent incidents, the cash for questions scandal. It took forever for a lot of the press to take this up, and of course we all know that um, you know journalists often move in a sort of great caravan together. You know they stick together, uh, and you know fads take off as quickly as they can simply sometimes disappear. And the the problem really was that a kind of a narrative had been established around a, a Labour leader who really, frankly, didn't fit in as far as much of the political establishment media were concerned. And it became apparent that many of his MPs didn't like him either. And so you had this kind of feeding frenzy. Uh, and yes, we have a situation whereby clearly, um, seriously, bad things have happened. I mean, we've we've had some quite excitable claims, but but the, when you when you when you when you watch the documentary again, you realise they're not excitable. It's not um, it's not over egging the pudding to say that uh, crimes may well have been committed. And in fact, Peter, at one stage, I think that you say that on you know perhaps uh, you know some of these some of these files were handed over to the Metropolitan Police. They might be taking an interest, as they may well be taking an interest. We read today in the Guardian with the goings on within. Uh, Croydon, um, which was the subject of your fourth uh, part of the documentary, Richard, where we um, where we saw essentially um, uh, p political uh, operatives hacking uh, local media, a most extraordinary turn of events. So, but 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 Peter, to you, um, do you? Here's the question. This is actually a question from uh, Clarice, who's in Nottingham, um, and Clarice is. Uh, do you think, Peter, that the Labour Party will have to make a response to the claims in this series? And if not, um, won't the Tories be keen to use some of this as ammunition uh, at the inevit as, as inevitably coming up to a, a general election? 
Um, I see no evidence. Uh, I hate to disillusion Clarice, but I see no evidence that the Labour Party is going to get involved in any of this. I think the Al Jazeera, you know, doorstepping, or as it were, all of those senior Labour figures and getting nowhere, I, I'm sure that is going to um, continue. That They won't get involved. Uh, you, and maybe the Conservatives will try to make a mischief, but I would bear in mind that the Conservative Party um, is a record on similar issues is absolutely shocking. So if I was them, I'd be careful. I, they will be considering the, the uh, capacity potential for blowback if they if they do. Can I just check one thing with Richard? Because he, while I was talking, he uh, fell off the. He, he, something went wrong with his internet. I, I was adding after the, the the discussion of the Seamus Milne email, Richard. I was saying from memory, I think the Ford report was very um, had a, had a look at the panorama coverage of that and was critical. Yeah. I wanted to get that. Yeah. Entirely misleading. It says the the coverage of that email and others by Panorama and others, and it's it's quite a general critique. And it refers to a specific period. It's the sort of interregnum between uh, Ian McNichol and Jenny Formby as a general secretary. There's a period where there's the the leadership does get involved, and it it, see, it seems that they got involved because they were invited to, and then later on all those emails suddenly appeared. I, I think it was initially in the Sunday Times, and then. Um, and then in the in the panorama, no, but the the Ford report is very clear and strong on this. It says the 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 interpretation, the representation of those emails as showing the leadership as interfering in the complaints process is entirely misleading. Those are the words of the Ford report. Yeah, and that's why the uh, that's why I think the BBC does have a duty. It's after all, a, 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 you know, it's a great public body. It, it's uh, I love the BBC. I, I revere it. But if it does, if journalism is um, examined in the robust way and very concrete way that your program does, um, and it's in, and it particularly a program of such importance, uh, you know, which undermines anybody watching it, I think comes away thinking that it's pretty well must be uh, immoral to to vote for Labour, the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. I do think that it's an intervention by the BBC in the political process. And given that your program, the Al Jazeera program, does contain not general assertions, which can be batted, but actually a series of specific allegations about the BBC reporting, I do think it has a, a national duty uh, uh, to actually to deal in detail with the concrete points which you are making. They all involve real people in real circumstances and you go into remarkably telling um and and i thought found very shocking uh detail about you yes um, I, I, I think um i think it is extraordinary because the, the the you know obviously we sent them a right of reply and they replied to the right of reply and they basically you know basically they said we stand by our journalism off cleared us we stand by our journalism there was no there's mm -hmm. there has been no attempt you know, anyone watching those four allegations will think, well, you know, that's a pretty steep allegation and the evidence looks pretty compelling. And I think it's quite disconcerting not to get any response, any attempt at explanation. It should thing. be very easy for them. Yeah, because it's, 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 it's know, actual stuff. If they, if they, it's very, they can rebut you and they can say no, and this allegation was completely wrong and here's why. Uh, but what I, uh, uh, and... But if they're going to reject this program, then they really must explain. It's actually very simple to explain why you and Al Jazeera got it wrong. And that's what they should do in a, in really in a democratic society. The same applies also, of course, to the mainstream press, uh, which ran all these stories. It wasn't just uh, the BBC. And... Um, day after day after day and i would say to my colleagues in the british media many of whom i deeply respect as journalists they really if you're going to publish something all this kind of material about jeremy corbyn and it's now being challenged you do have a absolute duty as a human being but also above all as a journalist to come back and explain why 
the, these attacks on my journalism or I was ro a, a, a wrong and I was right, or to say, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. There's nothing dishonorable about that, just to say, I made a mistake, I've looked and seen what I've written, uh, and I actually got this wrong, this wrong, but I think this one may have been right, or something of the sort. And I, th I cannot understand, because journalists, this is a, the double standard of journalists, um, I find tricky, i.e. they're constantly political journalists um, holding uh, up governments or politicians to account, uh, saying that, uh, uh, yet when their own act, uh, and, that, and that's what they are for, is to hold authority and power to account, but then when anybody criticizes them, they, they, it's either met with a sort of deep umbrage or, to in this case, total, total silence. Well, yeah, you know, I think they have to go at the BBC. Yeah, yeah. A, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of the people who've been in touch with us, and a lot, of course, you know, far more on social media and elsewhere, are, are still very angry, actually, um, particularly with the Guardian newspaper, because a lot of people, essentially, whether they like Jeremy Corbyn or not, but wanted to see the end of that of a Conservative government, very upset because they think that, that the, the, some of the Guardian journalists were really quite complicit in, in, in what was going on. And the, what the point they're also making is, is that, to a degree, this is continuing. Um, you mentioned the, the Ford report that was set up. Um, of course, this is, it's, it takes a bit of work, as you know, Richard, to look at all of this stuff and to do some proper journalism. But the Ford report, um, which was pretty, pretty castigating, really, and the Labour Party promised to act on it, there's been very little reporting of that. There's been... As far as I could see, um, no reporting really at all about the fact that the uh, a, a Jewish member of the who was elected to the Labour Party's ruling body, its National Executive Committee, was suspended two days before the conference um, for speaking to some prescribed paper two years ago. I mean, some nonsense, and they took away her visitors' pass, and also that the, the in, in, in in sort of committing to a side of the argument within the Jewish community. Um, the Labour Party appears to have sided with one group of people against another. And hence, we're seeing an awful lot of the Jewish Labour Party members being expelled. And I suppose here's the next uh, rather long-winded attempt to ask a question, which is to go to that video by uh, the, 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 to the video of um, Halima Khan, uh, who you interviewed. And Halima uh, Khan... Um, worked in the investigations team. She came into the Labour Party, it seems, without any great sort of political uh, knowledge about how it worked and um, clearly had no idea of just how toxic it can be. But um, she had some very interesting claims as well, which makes it still a current story. I wonder if we've got... Um, a short clip of the to scour through Facebook pages and social media pages of individuals who we were looking for anti-Semitic material for. The word Palestine was included as a search term, which was the thing that alarmed me the most. We would act almost immediately to any inquiries that would come in from the Jewish Chronicle or Jewish News, um, even if it was you know, at close of play, we would often get instructed by the directors to just stay behind so we can take action on those those individuals. Well, Richard, what's interesting with, with um, Halima Khan, um, uh, who, who I, I believe no longer uh, works for the Labour Party. I mean, she was given, it would appear, a very clear indication that her career was not going to advance, particularly uh, if, she, if she raised... Uh, political issues that uh, were rather uncomfortable. Um, but, but, but from what she was saying, it was, it was not only, uh, you know, trigger words like uh, Palestine um, that got people sort of responding, uh, uh, but there was a kind of hierarchy of importance to attach to complaints. Um, and, you know, dur during your documentary, you look at the way, for instance, complaints that were made about Trevor Phillips were dealt with, or uh, another journalist, Rod Little. I must admit, I was really rather surprised to learn that Rod Little had been a member of the Labour Party, but there we are. I mean, what, you know, and, and she also part and parcel of the claims that have been made is that essentially with this hierarchy of complaints and importance, some people feel that um, 
you know, there are there are there are there are other offenses deemed potential offenses deemed more important than others. And that actually more seriously than that, that there is a kind of uh, racism attached to the Labour Party, not denied by the Labour Party, but the but racism. What what would you say to that? Well, uh, Ford uses the expression hierarchy of racism, I think, three or four times. And he's 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 very um, clear eyed about it. And the, the Trevor Phillips story is a shocking one. That's actually in the third film, Torrell Dixit's film. Um, uh, and that's an extraordinary story. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that Trevor Phillips has said that if you replace the word Muslim with Jew, um, it's, it's inconceivable. It's, it seemed very unlikely he would be in, in the Labour Party. I mean, I think, you know, that Halima was talking about scouring social media there. In a way, what's happened in the Labour Party in the last six years is an extraordinary experiment. No other political party in the world, I don't think, has ever been through this, where the, the membership, I mean, basically it turned itself into a huge surveillance operation with the assistance of a number of outriders. You had groups like Labour Against Anti-Semitism and the Jewish Labour Movement who were you know, spending hours and hours and hours combing people's social media to find things that could be interpreted as anti-Semitism. I shouldn't think any... The, part, the membership of any political party in history has been so thoroughly scoured for one particular fault. And at the end of that, it's very important to sort of see this in context, at the end of that, end of that six years, including the, you know, the, the, since Starmer came in, which is quite a considerable period now, at the, at the end of that, the total number of people deemed worthy of even a preliminary investigation for anti-Semitism in the Labour Party is considerably less than half of 1%. And that yeah. figure includes people like Andrew Feinstein and Naomi and, and, and Jenny Manson uh, and, and so on. Now, you set that against the fact that, you know, polling shows that in the Conservative Party, 47% of members think Islam is a threat to the British way of life. And then you look at the extraordinary disproportion in, in the way the media has covered those two issues and stories. And on, I think the term hierarchy of racism <laughs> scarcely does it justice, really. Well, you know, Peter, it's it, because um, because the Labour files, there's a huge, there's a major concentration on what has happened and the surveillance of Labour Party members, um, particularly around the issues of anti-Semitism. Uh, it's kind of it's sort of passed journalists by that actually this surveillance that Richard is talking about is and going uh, is and is going uh, potentially much further and much faster. Um, we saw at that Labour Party conference um, a delegate being immediately uh, suspended from the party for getting up at the rostrum um, and, and making claims about President Zelensky's government with regard to banning trade unions. Now, you can agree with what he said or not, but the whole point about a political party is that people will hold different opinions in it so long as they are not uh, in, a, in breach of the law. And what we appear to be seeing is a kind of... Um, well, let's be let's be let's put it quite bluntly, a kind of uh, a, a new Stasi, if you like, but better. They've got better equipment, um, and that, that you know this the Labour Party of today um, has honed these uh, devices and de uh, the way it was dealing with uh, uh, allegations of anti-Semitism in a way that could be used, frankly, and is possibly being used against anybody who speaks against, uh, against the leader uh, or against his policies. Uh, I mean. <laughs> would, would you concur with that, or do you think that's all a bit far-fetched? I think what Rich, what the uh, Al Jazeera films did, uh, I mean, reveals some really troubling stuff, which the Labour Party needs to um, look at. On the other hand, I, in many ways, uh, that the incident you refer to at Labour conference, I mean, uh, Mr Starmer very honourably wants to be the next prime minister and to take Labour into power. Um, and uh, message discipline, or whatever the expression used um, by sort of strategists. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you were never much good at it, uh, <laughs> Mark, but um, I, uh, I, I, you were, a, you, although you were on the National Executive Committee, I think, for a while, um, I understand why Labour wants to... Um, keep good order as it advances to power. And I have to say, I personally, in the wake of last week in, well, what we've seen for the last 10 days of the Conservative government, mm -hmm. where I actually feel frightened of having these people running the country because of what they've done to our interest rates, our mortgages, 
Um, I want Mr. Starmer, I said this as a conservative really, I, I want Mr. Starmer to become the next prime minister. And I, the sooner the better, and the best, sooner, uh, sooner we get Truss and Co out, because I think they're dangerous to just sort of ordinary people now. That's what, uh, so I, I, I can, uh, look, a, a political party has got to be run uh, with, you know, so put out a co coherent message. On the other hand, the reason I'm here on, you know, I, I was glad to appear on Richard Sanders' film and the Al Jazeera films is that some of the stuff which Labour was doing is, is appears to have done and where it, which needs answering is, is goes beyond sort of message discipline into intrusion, into mm. uh, into um, targeting people in an, in an improper way uh, and smearing people who, uh, you know, the, I found the first film, a lot in that, you know, that ordinary, as if you did, ordinary people appear, I use the word appear, I'd love to see the answers to what was found, ordinary party members to be smeared as homophobes. It was really horrible. I mean, they were interviewed, they, were, uh, they came over to me as, as really decent people. And they're being put out, it's being smeared by their own party as being really horrible, foul people or ordinary party members being smeared as anti-Semites. That was another, in Richard's film, I found that very troubling. I mean, Liverpool that, Riverside, uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so I think there's one thing about, I, I can see exactly why Keir Starmer Labour Party would not want some anti-Zelensky person to go and uh, be given a national, a pla effectively a national platform on live TV. I can really understand that. Blair would have been done the same. Uh, and, he, and, uh, and and I can understand that. But some of this use of smears to effectively make unfounded and f what appears to me to be false allegations against decent party members is another matter. Yes. Well, you know, Peter, Richard, I mean, for what it's worth, um, you know, I'm of that vintage that remembers the run up to the um, election of Tony Blair as prime minister. Um, and I was on the national executive, as, as you mentioned then. And I, you see, the trouble is some of the tendencies that we see today are were writ large back then. And these are very, very unhealthy and dangerous and corrupting. Um, and it doesn't make for uh, good governance uh, and also for a healthy, happy political party that can actually uh, tolerate a degree of dissent. I don't think that Tony Blair did. I'm not aware of Blair in the run up to 97. Uh, doing anything like what? No, no, no. It's, uh, no, he, 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 he didn't. He didn't. And um, of course, the social media was not uh, extant in the way it is now. So you know, it, it, people can be picked up within a, a moment. I'm sure somebody may be watching me right now, saying, "What can we do?" But, but I'm not in the Labour Party, so you can't really do very much at all. But you see what I mean. And I think that um, essentially, yes, that there is a there is a problem because. Uh, what Richard and the documentaries found in the, the, the treatment of um, party members and also the treatment of a, of a leader who was not popular with many of his backbenchers, but was clearly quite popular with a, a membership that grew to half a million um, and did reasonably well, but failed to win in 2017 and did disastrously in 2019. But to have that level of uh, claim against you and against ordinary people was quite debilitating and possibly made that, uh, had, had an influence on, on, on electors, it must have done. Um, so the question surely must be, you know, as you go towards an, another election, yes, of course, you want a fairly disciplined, you know, health, you know, sort of forward looking party that people can trust, not full of complete lunatics. But at the same time, you cannot really get away with this, some of the behaviour that um, Labour Files has 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 shown up, and I would say there was there was another example, which was really rather disturbing. But two two examples that stuck out in my mind in particular. One was the sort of hacking of the Croydon media uh, inside Croydon, which was an extraordinary thing. Because you think, well, some of these people could be in government. What are they going to be thinking? Hacking the Daily Daily Mirror or something, or the Telegraph or whatever. Um, the other was the in the East London constituencies. Richard um, of Newham, where it appears from the, the, from your reports that party members were actually followed and their families were followed because there were there was concern amongst the party 
officers there could be packing of selection meetings. And as a result, a lot of people were expelled or suspended from the Newham Labour Party. And the Newham Labour Party wasn't able to pick its own candidates for the elections. They were imposed by the party itself. So what, um, what would you have to add to that? The actual the, the surveillance that appeared to be going on and also the hacking of um, inside Croydon. I mean, I think that the Labour Party has a problem. It seems to have a problem with, with Muslims. Um, if, you know, the polling indicates that, it, it indicates a collapse, you know, really quite dramatic collapse in support for the Labour Party amongst Muslims. Um, now, I, I think... Um, one of the problems Muslims have is where else do they go, of course, and you know whether they will in the end hold their noses and vote for the Labour Party is another matter. I suspect a lot of them will stay at home, but it seems to be a price the party is prepared to pay. Of course, a lot of Muslim votes in the red in the red wall. I mean, if you have a party which is led by people who call, all call themselves proud Zionists, I think to a degree they simply don't understand how problematic that is. For, for, for many Muslims. But also what Newham reveals, and actually if you look at the data about parties that are under special measures or suspended, and this is something that Shami Chakrabarti drew attention to six years ago, the Labour Party does appear very ready to expect <clears throat> Muslims of getting up to no good in terms of recruitment. I mean, there, there is a pattern one sees where the Labour Party the Labour Party appeared to viscerally react against the enormous surge in membership it got in 2015 and 2016. There is a tendency to see people becoming politically involved as entryism, and mm. people becoming politically involved successfully as seeking to take over. Now, this is something that they seem to feel in particular about, about the left, obviously, but it also, you know, you, you see this language used a lot about... Um, Muslims. Yes. You look at the case I, I, I might just come in there because I, I think what was very, and we, we've only sadly got about possibly a few minutes left, but I just wanted to come back to you on this because it was interesting to me seeing um, in, in your documentary mention of a number of individuals who I've known for years, since some of the, since the early 1980s, who work within the Labour Party um, and who were very active in the student uh, politics at the time. And uh, cut their teeth fighting the militant tendency, what they call the trots. You know, it's not something that you, has a medical condition, but it's a political, uh, it's a political perversion for some, possibly. But the thing is, their 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 obsession with trots, with the hard left, seemed to be transferred, as you were intimating, to this huge body of people, many who had never been involved in a political party before. I mean, my two kids, for one, um, you know, they had no knowledge. And, and they were all seen as a, a potentially problematic because, you know, ass essentially you don't want a party that's too big and too unmanageable um, and uh, and full of people who you can't control. And so that seems to have been a real, a real problem. It's been a it's real it's sadness that the, the Labour Party was not able to embrace that enthusiasm. It doesn't mean that the Labour Party instantly has to adopt all the views of everyone who's joining it, that it has to, you know, immediately relinquish control of the party to them. But, you know, it, it, it could have sort of absorbed that and, and, and channeled it. It could have re reacted much more constructively to it. And, and it does present the odd spectacle of a political party which, which appeared to viscerally react against having new members. You know, a lot of it is on a, quite a petty level, I think. I think local dignitaries, you know, didn't like their control threatened. And, and this is almost, you know, regardless of whether it's left or right. You know, there's a dreadful pettiness about Labour local politics that just didn't seem to be able to absorb that enthusiasm. And although, although I think they'll get away with it, they're, they're replaying the textbook of the 90s when we're not in the 90s, I think they'll get away with it because the sheer dreadfulness of the government, which, which um, Peter was touching on. But I think it's done sort of a, a profound sort of mortal damage to the soul of the Labour Party. The Labour Party has to be a broad church, it has to bring its wings together. And if it's under the control of people who almost see their entire raison d'etre as to be anti the left, that's, that's rather well, narrow. I think Peter, Peter, some at one stage, you said this is a party that appears to loathe its, loathe and despise its own many of its own members. Yes, um, I, I, I no doubt what the Al Jazeera films uh, show is that's exactly how they regard them. And uh, what is uh, and judging on the films. And again, I think this is something that the Labour Party ought to make plain, is why people like um, 
I think that, that Jenny Manson, for instance, is, is so just, you know, it has to come under suspension and investigation. And I did find that those people in, in, in Wallasey, um, you know, these are struck me as completely honorable, politically committed, ordinary people who are essentially being framed, according to Al Jazeera, as filthy bigots. And how the damn are they? What? So, the same in Brighton. And, how, and the same in Brighton. How yeah. dare the Labour sort of high command these sort of uh, bureaucrats in that central office in the kind of do that to volunteers mm -hmm. who are playing, all they're doing is being patriotic citizens by engaging in national, in, in, in political arguments uh, as, as Labour members. I, I found that terribly shocking. And I think there has to be a sickness in a party which encourages and then doesn't punish that kind of behaviour. I think if there was an ounce of decency, and just to take the example of Wallacey, because it really, in the Labour Party, and in Keir Starmer, they would, he'd investigate, order investigate, what happened at Wallacey? Is it true that these revolting statements were made at, in, in constituency Labour parties? If it wasn't, the Labour Party should uh, should should apologise to them. The same applies to some of the anti-Semitism claims. You know, that there's one uh, uh, one witness in the uh, in Richard's film about anti-Semitism saying, you know, people were saying day after day that Hitler didn't go far enough. What? But if they did, if were saying that in in constituency meetings, that means that these constituency meetings are just not just one person; they're all tolerating this kind of hideous language. And so that's and so that it's not just so that, that there's a terrible sm collective smear on pe local constituency party members, which and I if I was Keir Starmer, I like to think I would be really worried about that. I'm not saying he's responsible for it; absolutely not. But he won't. He's, he's, he should care about the about about the party he leads and the standards it abides by. And the, and the readiness of the media. The, the media is very culpable here. The readiness of the media to swallow any smear. You could say almost anything about Labour Party grassroots. I mean, in a way, that Izzy Lenga story stands as emblematic for the entire Corbyn period. Mm. Nobody in the BBC or in the broader media said, "Hang on, really." I mean, it wasn't like the Labour Party was an obscure sect at that time. It had almost 600,000 members. And there must have been large numbers of journalists and people at the BBC who knew people in the Labour Party, who were familiar with the culture of the Labour Party, who knew that this was entirely con inconceivable, that that was being said day after day within a Labour Party environment. And, and just nobody questioned it. It was extraordinary. Yes. I mean, it, you, it, 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 there has been an argument that essentially... Um, when some of these allegations were made, the leader of the Labour Party didn't hit back uh, hard and fast enough. Your programme, your documentary, of course, Richard, showed that uh, in terms of the um, work being undertaken by the Labour Party to investigate cases of anti-Semitism, things only really speeded up when um, uh, Corbyn got his own general secretary finally in. And that's the great irony. That, that it's one of the most extraordinary things. Yeah, there are, you know, the, the film operates on two levels. One is to say that on a most straightforward level, the idea that um, the, the, the previous right-wing leadership were desperately trying to tackle anti-Semitism and were being thwarted by all these ghastly left-wingers is, is totally undermined by the fact that once the ghastly left-wingers have control, the figures for suspensions and investigations and so on go up like that. Now, there could be explanations for that. You can find statistical explanations for that. But as Peter says in the film, that at the very least raises raises sort of profound questions. But then also on the film, we're, you know, we're, which we don't really have time to go into here, we're asking very profound questions about what are we talking about here as anti-Semitism? Um, you know, aren't we in fact, in fact, we're talking about Zionism here, that that is what the conversation should be about. And that is that that is where we have the great blind spot and we're, a, we're unable to have a frank conversation. And the great advantage of the conversation about anti-Semitism is while we're talking about that, we're not talking about Zionism. Yes. Um, and of course, you know, we and we, ha we haven't really been able to, to, to delve into this properly. Perhaps we can at another time. But um you know, clearly there was uh, there, there has been a political agenda to push back on essentially a, a Labour Party that has been taking much more uh, supportive view of the plight of the Palestinians 
Um, and there has been pushback. And I just there are a couple of questions, actually, um, given that we call uh, ourselves Palestine deep dive. Mohammed in London uh, says, Peter, Richard, uh, in your opinion, is the Labour Party a safe place for us Palestinians today under Keir Starmer's leadership? Uh, and is it a safe place for those vocally calling out human rights abuses around the world? It's a question that Leila in London asks as well. Can Palestinians really be expected to vote Labour? when even the name of our country has been treated with suspicion and used as a search term to find and expel members? That's a very, very powerful point, isn't it? I think they're rhetorical questions, aren't they? What, what do you it's think, Peter? Yes. Well, um, I mean, there are... Let's put the case for uh, Mr Starmer's Labour Party. Uh, I think that most uh, Labour Party MPs voted for Palest a Palestinian state when it was under Ed Miliband, didn't it? And I think that's worth remembering. Uh, there was a statement uh, today, I think, uh, Middle East I reported mm -hmm. it from Labour, although it was just a Labour spokesman, that they are opposed to the move of Jerusalem. Uh, sorry, let me throw uh, the move of the British embassy to, to, to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. Um, so if I was a, uh, a Palestinian, I would, I think I would feel happier voting Labour than I would uh, Conservative under Liz Truss. So well, uh, there's your answer, Leila and Mohammed. Um, it's a pretty low bar. Well, it's a, it's, <laughs> that's British <laughs> politics, folks. I'm sorry to say, and I'm also sorry to say that we have really run out of time. And I, you know, there's so many questions. There was so much to ask uh, Richard and Peter. Um, but, you know, what a fantastic uh, series of, of films, very powerfully made. A lot of people have been asking the question, you know, why, uh, why haven't other networks done the same? Well, we've tried to explore those questions with you both, and we've probably got some answers. Um, but you know, this is a kind of, uh, in many respects, it's a, it's quite, it's it's it, uh, it's taken a different, a, a different and clearer view of recent history and set the record straight in so very many ways. And if it hadn't been, then it would be being challenged. Richard's work would be challenged, and it isn't. Um, at all time, uh, at all times, uh, those who were being accused of various things were given the opportunity to speak and. Uh, they didn't. So there we have it. Um, Richard, Peter, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you. Very good of you. We, we thoroughly I, enjoyed I, I Very quickly say, 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 Mark, I mean, I, you know, clearly there is going to be a, a sort of a murder applied to this entire thing. Um, so please, 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 anyone watching, share these films as widely as, as you can, because it's the only way. You know, I think the truth is now out there. Uh, and once the truth's out there, you can't put it back in the bottle. But it's only it, it needs to be more widely distributed. So, and that's the only way it's going to happen is people sharing it in, individually. Can I say something too? That I, 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 I'm, you build, I was built on the publicity for this as a maker of, of the film. I'm not. I appeared on it and I was shown stuff and asked to comment. And I find it very shocking, and it does make me feel uh, that I needed to reinvestigate. The journalism, I, I, I'm really a columnist, actually. That's, you know, but you know what I wrote during the time, and I've been doing this for some time. I think we we have to do this, and this, but and this film, I think, particularly the second film, although I think all the films should be watched, is a landmark piece of journalism, um, and I think it will go a long way to. It, it, I think it will be looked back on in 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, as the turning point in the understanding of this issue and of the contemporary history of of Britain and and the Middle East and uh, the Labour Party, and also of course of um, the British media, which needs to look deep into its soul. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Richard, and thank you to Omar and team for making this happen. Uh, and until next time, thank you all. Bye bye. <music>